All right, Edmonters. That's uh, yeah. I don't. I don't think uh, Dave or Nathan, when they did interviews, realized that the people that listen to the Road to Edmond podcast are the Edmonders. The Edmonders. Yeah, they probably they probably know they're Edmonders. They're like the they're like the hype team for a movie they haven't seen yet. <laughs> they they're the internet equivalent of like the guy that twirls a towel around. On stage with a rapper, you know, like right. totally. Just they don't rap per se, right? Just jumping around. They're just so awesome. They don't have to do anything <laughs> except go what and <laughs> just scooting and uh huh. And now, now you get to hear from someone who worked extremely hard throughout the entire filming. Corey Hill, how are you doing? I am doing well. So. Uh, yeah, hang it up. He's not in a basement. He's in his co-working space. It looks yes. like a basement. Apparently, it looks like a basement. But uh, so so, um, how in the world did you end up being a part of the Road Deadman? Like, what did what made you say to yourself, you know, what I want to do this summer? I want to film trip. I want to spend two weeks with this guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the number one draw for sure. Getting to see you shirtless on a regular basis. Uh, I do what I can. Who can pass up that opportunity? <laughs> uh, yeah, Dave uh, asked me if he wanted if I wanted to be a part of it after working together on the Set Free Posse documentary we did the year before. Um, we worked together a lot, and um, yeah, I was just really excited at the opportunity to work in something semi-scripted, fictional, uh, controversial. And yeah, I was having a good time with Dave and excited to work with you and Nathaniel. I've met you guys previously once or twice and um, thought you guys would be a fun, fun crew to be a part of a project on. Well, um, what would you call your position other than sore back? Like, I think like the defining feature for you was how much back pain you were in by the end of the shoot. But uh, uh, it was a long, a lot of long days. Um, I guess I'd be camera operator there were basically two camera operators might be like co dps um me and brandon so yeah Uh, anytime you can use initials for your for what you're doing that's that's legit so the um uh give people an idea of what it was like for you just as someone who has worked in different types of films commercials non uh kind of documentaries to make the transition to whatever you want to call the road to Edmund, a, uh, a, a sketched fictional story. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was definitely a first for me as far as working on something that would be feature length, um, kind of indie style mm-hmm. film. And, uh, it was a learning experience. Um, uh, definitely. Gained a lot of knowledge about how things work in that regard a little bit, though it wasn't like a major production, so it wasn't quite that type of experience. But um, it was fun. It was exhausting. Uh, it was backbreaking, as you said. Um, it was cool to be to see the process um, and, and to develop each of the scenes organically because we really were shooting everything so much on the fly. Um, it was like like we said, semi-scripted. We had like an idea for each scene, kind of what you guys were going to be talking about, addressing, like trying to get through. Uh, but we never really knew what we were going to get because you guys were just going for it. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah you you were just recording it. So, <laughs> like, you, you're you not just like going, well, well who knows what's going to happen? What's, it, what's worse is you think you did something good and then I see your face and you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're going to use that one. And I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> that might not be the take. Yeah, I don't, I'm not holding you personally responsible for the, the first time we did the giant monologue in the car, where uh, I thought we were done because I I nailed it, and then everyone's like, "Oh, oh, the the cameras, they're just so shaky. You're gonna have to redo that entire monologue again, just one more time." By and then one turned into four, 
and then I stopped counting. It always does. It always does. So what? Um, so what about the uh, filming process itself? What stuck out? Like, what were the more um, memorable? You know, low, high moments uh, about making the film where you, you know, a year, a year from now, when it's two years into your memory, you're going to say, oh, when we made that, this happened. Oh, man. Um, memorable moments. I'd say low. It's definitely one night we were doing yeah, driving scenes. It was really late. We've been driving forever. It felt like it was dark. We were all just so over it. Uh, just a long, long day. We could not find like the right neighborhood to be driving through. Like it was <laughs> aimless driving. Dude, do you remember the one where um, we're in the middle of nowhere and y'all are driving? And Nathan and I are in the van that's in the movie behind y'all in the other van. And y'all decide to stop on this dirt road, and it my, it's at least five or six miles from anything near civilization. And you 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 stop in front of a a trailer, and a, a very angry man that lives in it is like oh, yeah. walking towards us <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with yeah. a bat. With a bat. Yeah. And, and Nathan and I are on the walkie-talkie, going, "No one here Come wants on. people with cameras." <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah. If you have to drive three or four miles to get to the uh, post office box because the post office doesn't go to the house, <laughs> then you definitely don't want a crew with film coming out. And Dave's Probably like, not. I think the street will work. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we better get out of here. What about, what about, um, how was your experience in the other car when we were looking for fish? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, we were shopping at Japanese sushi restaurants <laughs> looking for fish. Do you have any fish you could sell us? <laughs> there, I don't know how long we drove around Pueblo, Colorado, but we drove around this town over and over again. Everyone trying to find some place that might have a live fish. And <laughs> when you parked in front of a, 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 a restaurant and... I guess it was like a sushi place or something. Yeah, yeah Dave thought that'd be a good idea. He'd <laughs> rush in and see if they had any live fish they would give us. Oh my! And uh, <laughs> definitely a, a funny low moment. Well, when when they when they see the film and see the fish in it, they'll say to themselves, "Was that a tilapia that just came out of the Colorado River?" <laughs> Maybe. And, Maybe a tilapia. But the best part, the best part, and since Dave's not on this episode, um, uh, how did you feel ethically about the, what was communicated to get access to said tilapia? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he used loose, broad terms to describe the need for the tilapia. I mean, look, I'm just saying, if you go, if the pet store where you purchase. <laughs> A fish who is going to be hooked, thrown in cold water repeatedly, and then cooked. <laughs> they were not ex- <laughs> like they didn't know the right questions to ask. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I just I just remember him telling us what they said, and you can see Brandon's face like I think that's a lie, Dave. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you lied to those people. <laughs> It's like, not technically. <laughs> they didn't ask if we were going to cook them. Mm-hmm. Well, so when you're, when, what, what all were you hoping to, to, to bring to the film? Like when you heard the format that, you know, we're going to be creating the story and stuff together, it was a collaborative thing and that the film's wanting to tackle you know faith and sexuality and and Jesus and stuff like that like what out of your own story brought you to the film yeah um i think technically probably something i brought to the film is just my my experience is in filming kind of documentary and um nonprofit film stuff and so i just have a lot of experience with shooting in 
comfortable situations or difficult and challenging situations. So I think just like knowing how to work like that and knowing how to be super flexible and just go with the flow and work long days and um, take, take what we've got to work with and do the best we could with it. Um, so I just have a lot of experience in that, you know, aside from getting really technical camera stuff. But um, yeah, that was one aspect of it. And then as far as faith and, my background and everything, I grew up in a Christian home and at a Calvary Chapel church. And so just have a lot of background in what I think some of the audience will um, will relate with, with as far as the storyline goes and, and the aspects of challenges and faith. Um, and I think that I've shifted a lot from being super, super conservative background um, eschatologically and just like I'm on a different bit of a different journey path right now. I feel like I'm just challenging myself a lot lately and questioning a lot of things and trying to figure out why I believe what I believe, where I'm at, what do I agree with as far as um, doctrine in the church and whatnot. So it was a learning experience for me um, and a growing in my faith experience. So it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, um, when, when you talk about like growing up in the church and, and obviously you were, you've been involved in your congregation. So it wasn't like you just attended and stuff. Um, what, uh, like what were the, the parts of Cleo's character and things that, 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 I don't know the right way of asking it, but how did, what are the challenges to get his story right? Like, what are the what are the parts that if you if you weren't a part of a conservative evangelical, a large conservative evangelical church, it's easy to misunderstand or not get about the the faith experience one of the characters is you know bringing into the story and really wrestling with throughout. Right. Yeah, I think I think the challenge there was probably not using too much like what the church would call Christianese, uh, just terminology and language that people outside the church probably wouldn't understand um, in context. And, and on the other side of that, trying not to over-explain everything too much, you know, and like just in a way that wouldn't make sense for somebody to talk um, in conversation. Um, and so just finding that balance between people who totally are part of the church and understand all that and people who are outside of it and are like, I don't have a clue what this guy's talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and making it all relatable and funny and uh, real life. Uh, you know, uh, presenting it in a way in which people who are actually struggling with these things would um, would tackle them. Uh, but I think he did a great job. He did a really good job. So what... Um in your in your own kind of in your own story and stuff, you said you, you've gotten to a place where you're starting to ask questions and reflect on where certain beliefs came from. What was it, or, or when was it that you you gave yourself permission to ask those questions? Because sometimes it's not necessarily like what what topic comes up first that you you know start to think about your faith differently or whatever. Um, it's more becoming a person that asks those questions and then seeing it as part of your faith and not like those doubts and questions are a threat to it. Right. Totally. I think it was actually a few years ago on a trip to Israel. Um, I went over there for kind of like a peacemaking, mm-hmm. called a peacemaking trip and, and uh, not the typical um, pilgrimage type trip that most Christians go to Israel for. They just stop at all the locations and see the sites where Jesus walked or whatever and don't really uh, interact with the modern situation and people and the political climate and all that. It's just like this tour of 2000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a really focused trip on the conflict between Israel and Palestine and people groups. And I learned a lot about history in that regard. Um, and one thing that I basically was brought to light for me was that I am, or I was raised dispensationalist. And I just had, I didn't even know what that word was. I didn't realize mm-hmm. that's what it was. I was like, oh my God, I'm a part of a cult. I didn't even know it. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, that moment really probably was the biggest like change for me in like the beginning of this journey, which was I guess six years ago now. Um, yeah, it was kind of the beginning of like there are different angles, I guess, in, in different doctrines that I didn't necessarily understand. There were differences of opinion on in the Christian world. Uh, yeah, so that was probably the start of that journey for me. So if if you if you went back seven years then to seven years ago, Corey, what would he do when he uh, what would his response be when he sees the movie? I don't think I'd be offended by any means. Like I think I'd probably just. I think I'm a pretty flexible person in that regard. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I'm pretty open. Um, but I would hope that it would cause me to question things, or you know, want to d- dig deeper into certain aspects of my faith and and ask those bigger questions uh, in a real way instead of just like, uh, oh. I don't know how I feel about that, but I'm just not really going to address it because that's just a really hard thing to tackle. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's, and it is. It's hard to yeah. allow yourself to uh, mess with your identity in that way. It's it's uh, feels like a personal attack in a certain way. So. Mm-hmm. What, um, so when you are thinking through where you are now and the it's how do you hold your questions differently once you're comfortable having them? I think I just hold them more probably loosely. Um, I think like a lot of people tend to be, they just really want to hang on to a certain aspect or a certain opinion um, of things and, I think just allowing myself to not be so attached to certain ideas, uh, not see everything so black and white. It's hard. It's hard to come out of that. It's really a challenge to stop doing that once you, especially yeah, if you've been brought up to do that your whole life. It's really, it's really tough to do that. And I think that the, it's just nature, I guess. Um, I think we see that in all aspects of life, politically and spiritually and otherwise. It's just. Uh, it's just really easy to, to have that firm reality in your mind and you grasp on something. It's much easier than uh, holding things loosely. Mm-hmm. So when you when you think of your friends that are um, you, not your kind of people from church and stuff, but people that aren't a part of a faith community, aren't Christian stuff, what do you want them to get out of the film, or what do you what do you look or what kind of responses are you looking to see from them? Um, I hope they think it's funny. I hope they think it's, um, intelligent and educated. You know, I hope they think that they see the church in a different light, that they see Christians in a different light and, uh, that they, it would just bring to light that there are people that are more open, um, that not everybody in the church is super judgmental and negative and, Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I I think people think it's. I mean, if you like that type of humor, I mean, there's some people probably just don't like the style of humor. But if you like it, it's funny, and about every possible group gets used as a joke at some point. In, totally. Yeah. In the thing. So, um, one of the things I in just talking to some of my friends that are atheists and about the film and stuff, I'm like, I imagine like you, you'll have new material to use at your religious friends just because you watch the film (laughs) because no one can make fun of like the best group to make up jokes about yourself. Like, or yourself like, yeah. And so the, uh, the, the level of, uh, of, uh, Assaulting humor at everyone in the film is uh, intense. Um, the so when when you when you're when you watch film or it could be you know straight kind of fiction ones or not or documentaries and stuff like that. Like what what do you how do you treat a film as an opportunity for reflection? Or, or, or how do you engage in um, uh, 
I, uh, maybe ask it a different way. The, a lot of times you can watch a movie like the one we've made or plenty of others and you, you laugh, think something's funny or you're like, that's neat. Or, you know, you watch Gladiator and you're like, Oh, that's a really, really sweet battle scenes. There's a lot of dialogue between them. Um, and that kind of thing. And other times you can watch film and engage it and let the dialogue you're, you're having with your own questions, faith, experience and stuff engage the film and it gets to ask questions back at you and things. Um, well, what is it kind of describe your own relationship to film as an art and a place for reflection as someone who spends time making it? Yeah. Um, I personally, yeah, love movies that I want. My wife would say I love depressing movies. Uh, <laughs> and I think, yeah, I think that's probably why I like them is that I enjoy movies more that, engage me on a emotional level that's really real and raw and um, and then impactful on a real life level mm-hmm. uh, I think for this movie the challenge is trying to trying to be real and raw like that um, and to ask those questions without just asking them and and just being like in your face about them and annoying and whatever. And so um, I think that we did a pretty good job of that. I'm excited to see how it all, how it all pans out in the end, you know, editing changes a lot of things, but I think that uh, hopefully we'll get that across. Um, Yeah. I tend to really enjoy movies that ask those big questions and and get to think about that stuff in a way that doesn't feel super commercialized what's uh so what's what's one of your favorite films for the for reflection and provoking questions uh a movie a random one called igby goes down mm-hmm. uh, super depressing like everybody has cancer and it's like homeless and in relationships that are being torn apart but it just is a movie that asks a lot of big life questions and uh, challenges um I think that's, that movie just challenged faith a little bit. And yeah. A random one is good. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, w- the last question is uh, it's a deep question. It's actually what is a deep question you don't know the answer to? All right. What is a deep question that I don't know the answer to? That's the question. Yeah. What is a deep question I don't know the answer to? Uh, Man, a million of them? I don't know. Um, is I think right now have you have you seen any interviews of Jim Carrey lately? Uh huh. He's kind of lost his mind a little bit. He's on something. Like but I kind of like where he's at. With uh-huh. his questioning. I'm like I kind of get what you. He's kind of crazy, but I kind of understand. Just like. Are we here? What does any of this mean? What's the purpose? I don't know. I'm kind of on that that deep level with Jim Carrey right now. I'm just like, what are we doing? Do you have to admit that, like, you had to see him do that three or four times before you thought he was seriously there? Like the first time, you're like, is he playing a game with us? He's just being a weirdo. Yeah, he's just messing with us. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's actually there. I think he's really like. Uh, why? Why any of this? <laughs> Pretty interesting. Yeah. The, uh... Definitely. <laughs> the, I, the, him in that mode would uh, be the perfect person to interview the president. Oh my gosh, it would be insanely entertaining. Guru version of Jim Carrey. Yeah. Interviews Donald Trump. Exactly. That would have made the halftime like you know how the president used oh. to do those like interviews during the Super Bowl, but uh Trump doesn't like people asking him questions yeah. and, unless they're right. on his fan club, so he didn't do it. Right. No. But it, a, if he's surprising. like look, I know Lester Holt is our normal interviewer here at CBS, but <laughs> last time last time you said you fired Comey <laughs> <laughs> to get rid of the Russian thing when he just volunteered the information. So 
We're gonna try to we're gonna try to make it easier on you and let Jim Carrey interview you. He's a superstar. Here's Jim Carrey. <laughs> <laughs> That would be awesome. Oh, yeah, it would. <laughs>